And this is actually one of the most challenging uh, parts of the conference. I think where um, what we do is we challenge uh, the leaders of each of our sessions to present um, two days worth of discussions in two minutes. They've each got two minutes to present a summary of the findings of each of their workshops. I think this is the fourth year that I've been picked to volunteer to host this session. <laughs> um, it never quite goes the way I expect, <laughs> but we always get there in the end. So, without further ado, we're going to have two minutes on each session. And presenters are going to be kept very strictly to the two minutes. And if they overrun, they'll be in trouble. <laughs> so, I will set my alarm. First up is, I believe, Adam, are you going to talk about? I am. When does two minutes start? Okay, so we were designing a learning and learning strategy for a Howard institution. Uh, we use this template, which is a business model canvas adapted, to try to help us look at the different aspects that might need to come together to make a sensible kind of strategy. It's thinking that we're going to have to pitch things kind of as a business model in some sense internally. And we all found it was really problematic. We put tons of people in here, and then we found the rest was totally unworkable. So what are we going to do about this? The big problem, really, was that there's so many interrelationships um, that seem to emerge into the different stakeholders, the different value propositions to them. Very hard to tease these apart. So we seem to come really to kind of two conclusions. One was, uh, if it was going to be a strategic response, it would be very focused on a particular area, like something like retention or league tables, and then everything else would happen around that, very narrow in a sense. Or maybe that we shouldn't have a, quote, learning analytics strategy at all, and then we should think about putting in place some of the changes to information management, governance, privacy, all those kind of things that would help a more emergent and organic process by which people could use some idea of learning analytics and have the framework within which they could take action without lots of problems and questions being asked. This was a session organised in collaboration with the LACE project. I have put all of the information about using the business model canvas and photographs of our group work available via that URL. I welcome you to take a look and it is the Learning and Analytics Community Exchange. Please get in touch with us and make comments if you have anything to say. We would be very interested to carry on the discussion about a learning analytics strategy for a higher education institution. That's one minute, 35 seconds. Well done, Adam. Well done. <laughs> so I, I negotiated with Adam that I could have the other 25 seconds. That's more like that. Next up, we have Phil, who will be talking about learning resource metadata. Well, could just another attempt at the educational metadata. Your two minutes start now. Yes, a group of us got to, a group of us um, metadata fans got together with David Kernahan to discuss this <laughs> question. <laughs> um, and just to give you a little bit of background as to the uh, metadata that we've been inv involved with in the past. Um, there's a certain hardcore element to it, not just Dublin core, but hardcore element, uh, which gave rise to um, the movement which was created in counter-distinction to the, the edupunk mu movement, you might remember, of a few years ago, called Eduprog, to describe some of our beautifully crafted but rather baroque creations uh, of education, <laughs> e educational <laughs> metadata. Um, LRMI is different to that. LRMI is not just of the web, LRMI is in the web. It's in the web, it's in the pointy brackets of web pages. And that makes it different. For one thing, it means that it's somewhat more free form. If you've got thousands of people creating metadata in the same way that they create web pages, um, you might get something that's called a little bit of a mess, but I prefer to call it free form, uh, like free jazz there. <coughs> um, but also, most importantly, it is targeted towards um, what teachers actually want to do when they're trying to find resources and how they find those resources, we think. <coughs> uh, the end of the session, I think even David agreed that this seemed a little bit more sensible than previous approaches. Well done. <laughs> Next up, we have Open Education, A New World Order. Who is going to be presenting this? I know it was me wrong the session. Q, are you? So, so we had uh, uh, two very interesting talks in the first part of our, uh, our, our morning. 
uh, afternoon. Um, sorry, and uh, we had uh, um, Audrey Watters uh, talk to us uh, uh, and, and presented a picture of MOOCs as a kind of as a teaching machine. So, you know, the boys' toys is that a fair? Um, you know, it, it rather like the Google um, uh, self-driving car. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing to do, and you do it because it's an interesting thing to do, um, as opposed to. Um, uh, Amy Woodgate from Edinburgh, who gave a, a kind of a, a, a different view of MOOCs as a, as, as, a, as a fantastic fun experiment that we that we were doing. And it's a kind of interesting uh, 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 way of looking at these things. But the experiment is interesting, and uh, and and Amy, uh, uh, those of you who know about Edinburgh will know that Edinburgh have done now um, they're aiming for 30 MOOCs, and that's a lot of MOOCs. And they're kind of now pulling back a bit and saying, now, why have we done all this? What have we learned from it? Would we go on doing more? Are we going to move on? Are we going to use this to integrate into our, into our mainstream teaching? How, how are we going to use this? So the experimental stage is kind of coming to an end, she says. And I think you know, at Southampton, we, we'd agree that we're, kind of, we're a bit behind them, a year behind them. But, but I think in a year's time, we'll be doing the same thing, standing back and saying, why did we do all that? Then we did a bit of this uh, business canvas, um, business model canvas, Stuff and uh, and then we all broke the rules and didn't didn't put the, the right things in the right places, um, but uh, but we did come up with something. We, we we played the game from a point of view of a, of a research led university, a teaching focused um, university, and a new market entrant, probably Pearson, um, and the uh, the the, res the research focused one. They, they say, I, I, I don't think we really had loads of money, but. But, but, but there was enough money in the system to do it. Whereas the teaching focus people had to be much more... Go, go, go. <laughs> All right. Ah, this session was um, a very small select session, Brian and myself, with three other noble participants. Um, Brian explained a lot about Wikipedia, and I focused on questions of the culture and governance. Uh, now, you might be familiar with Wikipedia's five pillars, and I was concerned with the fourth pillar in particular about being nice to each other generally. It's not called that, but it's just being nice to each other. Um, because we had such a small select group, we were able to have a wide and free ranging discussion covering the interests of the participants. And uh, one memorable quote, it fired my enthusiasm for the whole thing, which we were all, which we're very, um, very grateful for. Now, I'll spend a little bit more time on the conclusions, if, if there were any conclusions. Uh, I was very interested, actually, by what we did come up with, because I'm not a Wikipedia expert at all. Myself, Brian's the Wikipedia expert. Um, Wikipedia has little cultural coherence. There's a danger of shock when people actually suddenly realize that it's not, that it's not, not all sweetness and light there. That needs looking at, needs, needs a bit of remedy. Um, we need some gentle enculturation, if that word sits nicely with you. Dissociate from the negative cultures and the technology and the language which harks back to nasty things and flame wars and stuff. Bring in new cultures, groups of people together. Make the editing process more transparent. And then bring the e-learning community. This is where it really comes down to our interest, bringing the e-learning community into Wikipedia. Update and maintain the key articles. This is Brian's hobby horse. Learn from the process of doing that and address the inevitable tensions. Build our culture of doing things, playing nice. And uh, it's, it's, it's a job to do. And there's a lot more to do than I anticipated there was. So it's really worth looking at this whole area. Thanks. Okay, who's next? Scott, sorry, I lost, your, I lost your black background, I'm sorry. Oh. You're going to have to be white. Oh dear. That's really depressing because we're the IT service management crowd and we have to be different to differentiate from e-learning stuff. Um, so, Phil gave us this challenge, or outlined challenge yesterday about applicant to alumni or you know, prospect to alumni and how we can respond to that. And so we looked at that problem first from the perspective of our IT services groups and how we manage our portfolio of technologies. And then a bit of role play from the perspective of all the other groups in the university <laughs> where we all had to do this very embarrassing exercise that was actually a lot of fun. Um, from the first point of view, from IT services management, 
we've got real problems in terms of managing the IT estate. We've got real difficulties in how we procure solutions that cross this boundary between services and software and across open and closed solutions. It is still an issue and it's a distributed problem across the organisation. And when we have stuff, we don't really have good processes for managing them and moving them on. Um, and we know that a lot of decisions are made in a way that doesn't really work properly for our advantage. Um, from the perspective of other staff in the organisation, their reaction to that is basically whatever. Um, they just care that stuff works. So the whole problem isn't their problem. Um, it's someone else's problem. It's the IT service. It's that problem. So we need some good tools to be able to address that because we're not going to get a great deal of support from colleagues as long as things work, they're happy. Um, but one of the tools we did find really useful, we're going to maybe do some more work on this model of identifying strategic and mission critical technologies and strategic upshift and downshift, um, because this seems to be something that's particularly broken in organisations, in that we tend to buy systems or procure them in, depending on which people are on which committees, rather than which ones are actually strategic or which ones are actually mission critical. And that says we've got a governance issue to need to fix. Thank you very much. Uh, next, oh sorry, I beg your pardon, I thought it was open education, yeah, it's ebooks next actually, who's doing ebooks? <laughs> sorry Mariki. <laughs> so next up we have Wilbert telling us about ebooks, the learning platform. Indeed, that was the question that we asked ourselves, um, but before you, you know, um, ebooks, in principle you can stick almost anything in, 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 into that. Um, so why not make it into a, a complete VLE? But before you answer that question, you kind of have to, to think, okay, what exactly is the difference between an ebook generally, um, you know, as you download on your Kindle, versus an e-textbook? So we, we, we kind of brainstormed about uh, what those requirements were and then uh, compared it to the kinds of solutions that, that were out there. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, uh, the immediate one that always pops up in, uh, for e-textbooks is testing. Um, just having a formative test at the end of the chapter to, for, for the student to, uh, to uh, make sure that they've actually understood what it is they were, that, they had supposed to be, or that they were supposed to be learning. And that immediately opens the, the question is, is that going to be online or is that going to be offline? Um, and to, some solutions go for, for online, others um, encompass both online and offline. Uh, but it, it still is a bit of a question of, well, hang on, uh, where it, does the web end and where does the ebook start? Um, it, it's, an, it's an unresolved one, uh, to, 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 to some extent. Um, the, the same kind of distinction uh, pops up in the creation side, um, slightly, more slightly more unexpectedly, um, because uh, the, uh, the effort required to, to create an ebook is that much uh, less. You can actually start to, get to make some really interesting things with remixing and reuse um, and uh, cloning and, and so on. And in that sense, Ebooks actually start to, I think, show uh, a real advantage over the web itself because they're editable. And that allows you to, um, uh, to, to tailor a textbook to uh, the requirements of a particular course and a, and a particular module. Uh, and I think that, that there's quite a bit of mileage in there. But there's lots more. Well, that might be very much. I'm slightly disturbed at the mention of cloning. I didn't realize that there was cloning going on in these sessions. <laughs> Next up, we have Open Education from Open Practice to Open Policy, and Honey from the Okay, so I was in the session Open Education from Open Practice to Open Policy, and here we have a picture of the lovely Suzanne presenting and a quote from the OER program, um, Many People, Many Practices, One Community. So the premise of the session was that there was an imaginary country, and in this country we had to decide whether we were going to have an open policy or not, and we had six different um, political ministers who would argue the case for or, not, or against for doing that. So we had David Kernahan, Paul Richardson, Joe Wilson, Suzanne Hardy, Paul Booth and Torre Holt who all argued the case. So basically it was a discussion on open policy in different institutions and um, so whether it's working, how it's working, what exactly policy is. So here are some of our musings, um, which you know, just some of the things that we came up with in the session. So the idea of... Um, people sustaining open education, not policy. So it's very much driven by individuals, driven by people and actions that are going on um, by um, people out there. 
Um, that practice is more powerful than policy, but policy legitimizes that practice. That was actually a quote from Simon Thompson. And just the idea of, of making a bit, a bit of a driver there, coming from both different directions, from the bottom and the top as well. Um, the policy itself can be burdensome sometimes. Um, there can be issues around that. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, it isn't always conducive to, to practice itself. Um, we also had some good discussions around ownership, who owns content in universities, licensing, um, even got onto areas like formats and, you know, the whole concept of OER and, and breaking OERs down. Um, then we talked a, a little bit about the gap between policy and practice, what people are actually doing, how long policy takes to come through in Russell Group universities, you know, just the whole getting things um, sort of put in place and can be a nightmare. But I think one of the sort of decisions that we made at the end was that it's really about building capacity, making sure that people understand what they're doing. Some of the stuff we talked around was about um, how open education can filter into other areas like schools, um, so about how people can reuse resources. And uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>